Some of the information is based upon research derived from the information that I saw. For instance, in the documents that I saw, it was stated that President Eisenhower had commissioned a group called the Jason Scholars, which was stated to have been a secret society of scholars, to research the deception, lies, facts, truth, and get at the root and the real truth of the alien question. It also stated that there was a group of 12 men formed by NSC Memo 5410 and that the study group was formed by NSC Memo 5411 and that the NSC Memo issued to cover the actions of these men and explain the reasons why such prominent men were meeting on a regular basis and that NSC memo was 5412-1 and 5412-2. 5412-1 was implemented in March of 1955, 5412-2 in November of 1955. Anyone who knows how correspondence, executive orders, and executive memos are written knows that you do not write a memo 5412 in March, and then in November tack a second part onto it. The memo was originally really written in 1954. I'm going to go through the whole history. I'm going to have to leave a few things out simply because it's going to be impossible to cover everything in this hour and a half that I have. Before I begin, I would like to read two quotes to you. The first is attributed to Mr. Alistair Cook, who said, quote, I'll be astounded if this planet is still going 50 years from now. I don't think we'll reach 2,000. It would be miraculous." Unquote. Winston Churchill said, and I quote, We seem to be moving, drifting, steadily against our will, against the will of every race and every people and every class towards some hideous catastrophe. Everyone wishes to stop it, but they do not know how. What do you think he was referring to? Ronald Reagan stated on October 18, 1983, in a meeting with Thomas Dine, who is the executive director of the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. And I quote Ronald Reagan, you know, I turn back to your ancient prophets in the Old Testament and the signs foretelling Armageddon, and I find myself wondering if, if we're the generation that is going to see that come about. I don't know if you've noted any of those prophecies lately, but believe me, they certainly describe the times we're going through. Now, ladies and gentlemen, during this talk that I'm going to give you, I'm going to explain to you the history of this phenomenon, who the secret government really is, and I will name them by name, beginning group, the study group. I will tell you who they are today. I'm going to tell you what this is all about. I'm going to tell you who's selling drugs to your children, and I'm going to tell you why the United States government is afraid for you to find out what the truth is regarding UFOs. <laughs> I'm going to skip over the early saucer recovers, recoveries, but there are many more than what you would expect. The early saucers... Mm. Is this any better? There were many more saucer crashes and down craft than what you have realized. There were many more alien bodies recovered, and there were more live aliens recovered than what you are aware of. But that's not important. The important thing is, is that they occurred, not how many and not where. The important thing is that they occurred. And those of you who want to argue over how many and where and how many bodies are wasting the time of everyone else because that's not important. What's important is that they occurred. And there are two crashes that are so important that the government will go to any lengths 
to prevent you from finding out. And those are two crashes which occurred near the city of Aztec, New Mexico. Why? Because both of those crash craft contained human body parts. And they are deathly afraid of a national panic. <coughs> Because of this, there was a very, very tight security blanket screwed down tight over all of the alien question, the down craft, the fact that they were here, the technology that we were recovering. Some craft, strangely enough, were not damaged at all. But we could not recognize anything that we had previously known as mechanical, electrical, hydraulic, or any other thing that we knew of, except eventually we discovered that the craft contained a small reactor approximately the size of a large football or a small basketball, which was said to be a clean reactor. And the craft, this particular craft, used or seemed to use water as fuel. Now, how that all works, I don't know. I am not a nuclear physicist. Thank God. <clears throat> a special group of America's top scientists were organized under the name Project Sign in December of 1947 to study the phenomenon. There was no such thing at that time as MJ-12. <coughs> the whole nasty business was contained within the shroud of secrecy. Project Sign evolved into Project Grudge in December of 1948. A very low-level collection and disinformation project named Blue Book was formed under Grudge. Sixteen volumes were to come out of Grudge, including the controversial Grudge 13, which I and Bill English saw read and revealed to the public. Blue teams were put together to recover the crash discs and dead or alive aliens. The blue teams were later to involve into alpha teams under Project Pounce and Project Pluto. During these early years, the United States Air Force and the Central Intelligence Agency exercised complete control over the alien secret. The Air Force was later to be dropped because it was a young service that had no political power and could not overcome the power of the Army and the Navy. In fact, the CIA was formed by presidential executive order, first as a Central Intelligence Group for the express purpose of dealing with the alien presence. Later, the National Security Act was passed, establishing it as the Central Intelligence Agency. The National Security Council was established to oversee the intelligence community and especially the alien endeavor. It was not created specifically to form national policy. In fact, the National Security Council was the forerunner of MJ-12, and there was another group between MJ-12 and the National Security Council, which is to come later. A series of National Security Council memos and executive orders removed the CIA from the sole task of gathering foreign intelligence and slowly but thoroughly legalized direct action in the form of covert activities at home and abroad. On December 9, 1947, Truman approved issuance of NSC-4, entitled Coordination of Foreign Intelligence Information Measures, at the urging of Secretaries Marshall, Forrestal, Patterson, and the Director of the State Department's Policy Planning Staff, Kennan, who, by the way, were all members of the Council on Foreign Relations. The Foreign and Military Intelligence Book One, final report of the Select Committee to Study Governmental Operations with Respect to Intelligence Activities, United States Senate, 94th Congress, Second Session, Report Number 94-755, April 26, 1976, page 49, states. This directive empowered the Secretary of State to coordinate overseas information activities designed to counter communism. A top secret annex to NSC-4, which was NSC-4 Alpha, or 4A, for those of you who are confused by military terms, instructed the Director of Central Intelligence to undertake covert psychological activities in pursuit of the aims set forth in NSC-4 and secretly was to run a psychological operation against the American public to hide the presence of UFOs and aliens. 
The initial authority given the CIA for covert operations under NSC 4A did not establish formal procedures for either coordinating or approving these operations. How many of you understand what I just said to you? Not too many. Let me explain it. What this means, the initial authority given the CIA for covert operations under, under NSC 4 Alpha did not establish formal procedures for either coordinating or approving these operations. That means they had to answer to no one. It means go do what you got to do. Don't bring any dirt back here because we don't want to see it. Just get the job done. Don't ask anybody. Don't report to anybody. That's exactly what it means. It simply directed the DCI, which is the Director of Central Intelligence, to undertake covert actions and to ensure, through liaison with state and defense, that the resulting operations were consistent with American policy. So the only guideline was that it was consistent with American policy. Later, NSC 10-1 and NSC 10-2 were to supersede NSC 4 and NSC 4A, and NSC 10-1 was to establish the Office of Policy Coordination, or the OPC, it was chartered to carry out an expanded program of covert activities. It was directly responsible for the alien task projects. And it was the direct forerunner of MJ-12. NSC 10-1 and 10-2 validated illegal and extra-legal practices and procedures as being agreeable to the national security leadership. The reaction, of course, was very swift. In the eyes of the intelligence community, no holes were barred. Under NSC 10-1, an executive coordination group was established to review, but not approve, covert project proposals. Why? Because if you've ever read or known anything about President Truman, he was a mean little guy. And he didn't believe in trusting everybody else to do the right thing. And he kept the power solidly in his hands. He did not give it to anyone. citizens and have volunteered their help in aiding me in attempting to educate the American people as to how far down the garden path they've really been led. We were concerned, as I know that many of you are, that the information may instill the wrong type of feelings in people. And you don't need to have those types of feelings. Uh, Ms. Claudia Cadley of the Volunteers from Los Angeles came up with a statement and we passed it around and tossed it around and we decided that this is going to be our policy after we had all added our little piece to it. I think it says quite a bit I think it's going to tell you quite a bit where I'm coming from and where a lot of concerned people are coming from, and I hope that it sets the stage and puts you in the proper frame of mind for the information that is to follow. Ladies and gentlemen, the world needs to hear the truth. The world also needs more peace, compassion, and cooperation. We already have too much fear and confusion. Too many people are feeling hopeless, and victimized. What is offered here is startling information. And what I ask is that if you choose to accept it, you do so with the understanding that it would not come to our attention now if we did not have the ability to successfully respond. But successful only if we bring our highest thoughts, energies, and feelings to take positive action we are not here to create more confusion, fear, or negative energies of any kind. And it is important that we not give in to those in ourselves, as it would only add to what the world already has. Fearing and 
fighting is the old way. We've tried to change the world. And the result has been that those who managed to be the victors brought the same constrictive and negative patterns back into power. We have now come to the threshold of a new understanding that we must fight fear with confidence, hatred with love, separateness with unity, and beliefs of being a helpless victim with the acknowledgement and acceptance of the power we have to create our own lives and then our world. It can only go in that order. For if we are still creating confusion and negativity in our own experience, we can only contribute that to the world. We can change the world. But it will not be by outward action alone. To the extent we can bring truthfulness, compassion, and peace in our own lives is the exact extent to which we will bring them into the world. This does not mean that we have to sit in our rooms until we perfect our own lives, but to realize that if we see ourselves as victims, we will be victimized. Others, I and Bill English, were to view years later in Grudge 13. Why do they keep the aliens in a Faraday-shielded environment? Because they have a tendency to disappear right through walls. And if you can prevent the transmission of electromagnetic energy, you can stop them from doing it. In late 1951, E.B. became ill. Medical personnel had been unable to determine the cause of E.B.'s illness and had no background from which to draw. E.B.'s system was chlorophyll-based and he processed food into energy much the same as plants. Waste material was excreted almost exactly the same as plants. It was decided that an expert in botany was called for. A botanist, Dr. Guillermo Mendoza, was brought in to try and help him recover. Those of you who have been looking for him on medical lists will not find him there. He was a PhD in botany. Dr. Mendoza worked to save E.B. until mid-1952 when E.B. died. Dr. Mendoza eventually, according to the information that I read, became the expert on at least this type alien biology. In a futile attempt to save E.B., and to try and gain favor with this technological superior alien race, the United States began broadcasting a call for help early in 1952 into the vast regions of space. If you know they're better than you, and if you know they can 1952 and until recent years, there wasn't one in 50,000 people in the United States who even knew it existed. Its primary purpose was to decipher the alien communications and language and establish a dialogue with the, nation, with the aliens. This most urgent task was a continuation of the earlier effort and was codenamed Sigma. The secondary purpose of the NSA was to monitor all communications and emissions from any and all devices worldwide for the purpose of gathering intelligence, both human and alien, and to contain the secret of the alien presence. Project Sigma, ladies and gentlemen, was extremely successful. The NSA also maintains communications with the Luna base and other secret space programs. By executive order, the NSA is exempt from all laws which do not specifically name the NSA in the text of the law as being subject to that law. How many of you know what that means? That means we have a completely lawless organization running around the country doing whatever they want to do, answering to no one, and under no law which does not name the National Security Agency in the text of that law as specifically being subject to that law by executive order of the President of the United States. That means that if the agency is not spelled out in the text of any and every law passed by the Congress, it is not subject to that or those laws. The NSA now performs many other duties and in fact is the premier agency within the intelligence community. Today, the NSA receives 75% of the monies allotted to the intelligence community. 
And the old sayings, ladies and gentlemen, where the money goes, therein the power resides, is absolutely true. The DCI today is mainly a figurehead. He is in charge of the CIA. The CIA does have many functions which are useful to this country and some which are deadly to us. The DCI, of course, is in charge of that agency. But he is not, as everyone thinks, the head of the intelligence community. That position really and truthfully lies with the director of the National Security Agency. The primary task of the NSA is still alien communications, but now includes other alien projects as well. President Truman had been keeping our allies, including the Soviet Union, informed of the developing alien problem since the Roswell recovery. This had been done in case the aliens turned out to be a threat to the human race and thus the world. Plans were formulated to defend the Earth in case of invasion. These were international plans which included most of the countries of the world. Great difficulty, however, was encountered in maintaining international secrecy. It was decided that an outside group was necessary to coordinate and control international efforts in order to hide the secret from the normal scrutiny of governments by the press. The result was the formation of a secret society which became known as the Bilderbergers. The headquarters of this group is in Geneva, Switzerland. The Bilderbergers evolved into a secret world government that now controls everything. The United Nations was then, and is now, an international joke. In 1953, a new president occupied the White House. He was a man used to a structured staff organization with a chain of command. His method was to delegate authority and rule by committee. He made major decisions, but only when his advisors were unable to come to consensus, and when he was in the army, he was known as the diplomat. He was very good at what he did. He was very good at bringing people together, reaching consensus, and getting people to work for him. His normal method was to read through or listen to several alternatives and then approve one. Those who worked closely with him have stated that his favorite comment was, just do whatever it takes. Now here's a man very different from President Truman. He spent a lot of time on the golf course. This was not all, all unusual for a man who had been career army with the ultimate position of Supreme Allied Commander during the war, a post which carried five stars along with it. In fact, he deserved it. This president was General of the Army, Dwight David Eisenhower. During his first year in office, 1953, at least 10 more crash disks were recovered along with 26 dead and four live aliens. One of the four live aliens died within hours of being removed from the craft. The others died approximately three or four days later. Of the 10, four were found in Arizona, two in Texas, one in New Mexico, one in Louisiana, one in Montana, and one in South Africa. And there were hundreds of sightings. Why were so many craft crashing? Because the government was scared. And when they found out that the radar was downing the craft, they started aiming the radar at the craft with lock-on radar and pump the juice through. And they brought as many down as they could. Eisenhower knew that he had to wrestle and beat the alien problem. He knew that he could not do it by revealing the secret to the Congress because, in fact, isn't that the same as telling the public? Early in 1953, the new president turned to his friend and fellow member of the Council on Foreign Relations, Nelson Rockefeller, for help with the alien problem. Eisenhower and Rockefeller began planning the secret structure of alien task supervision, which was to become a reality within one year. The idea for MJ-12 was thus born. It was Nelson's uncle Winthrop Aldrich who had been crucial in convincing Eisenhower to even run for president. The whole Rockefeller family and with them the Rockefeller empire had solidly backed Eisenhower. Asking Rockefeller for help with the alien problem was to be the biggest mistake Eisenhower ever made for the future of the United States and most probably all of humanity as you will soon see. 
what he literally did with this act, ladies and gentlemen, is abdicate the presidency to a secret group. Within one week of Eisenhower's election, he had appointed Nelson Rockefeller chairman of a presidential advisory committee on government organization. Rockefeller was responsible for planning the reorganization of the government. New Deal programs went into one single cabinet position called the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. And when the Congress approved the new cabinet position in April of 1953, Nelson was named to the post of undersecretary to Ovita Culp Hobby. In 1953, also, astronomers discovered large objects in space which were moving toward the Earth, and it was first believed that they were asteroids. However, if you know much about astronomy, you know that you can predict or project or project backward orbital paths of bodies in space and determine where they come from, what they're doing, where they're going, and what their orbital path really is. Well, this failed to pan out. And the evidence proved that the objects could only be spaceships intelligently guided. Project Sigma intercepted alien communications, and when the objects reached the Earth, they took up a very high orbit around the equator. There were several huge ships, and their actual intent was unknown. Project Sigma and a new Project Plato, through radio communications using the computer binary language, which the aliens understand very well, they're very mathematical minded was able to arrange a landing that eventually resulted in face-to-face -face contact with alien beings from another planet. Project Plato was tasked with establishing diplomatic relations with this race of space aliens. But in the meantime, something else happened. In the meantime, a race of human-looking aliens contacted the United States government. Where this happened, I do not know. I wish that I did. This alien group warned us against the aliens that were orbiting the equator and offered to help us with our spiritual development. They demanded that we dismantle and destroy our nuclear weapons as the major condition. They refused to exchange technology, citing that we were spiritually unable to handle the technology which we then possessed, and has not that been true throughout our history. They believed that we would use any new technology to destroy each other as we always have. This race stated that we were on a path of self-destruction and we must stop killing each other, stop polluting the earth, stop raping the earth's natural resources and learn to live in harmony with each other and with nature. These terms were met with extreme suspicion, especially the major condition of nuclear armament, disarmament, and I have to say that I could not blame them in the face of so many uncertainties and so many alien surprises staring them directly in the face. It was believed that meeting that condition would leave us helpless in the face of an obvious alien threat. We also had nothing in history to help with the decision. Nuclear disarmament was not considered to be within the best interests of the United States and the overtures were rejected. Later in 1954, the race of large-nosed gray aliens which had been orbiting the Earth landed at Holloman Air Force Base. It happened in 1954, ladies and gentlemen. If you take everything that Bob Immenegger has ever said and subtract 10 years from it, you will be right on the money. A basic agreement was reached. An alien named Krill was left as a pledge that they would return and formalize the agreement. In fact, he was a hostage. This race identified themselves as originating from a planet around a red star in the constellation of Orion, which we call Betelgeuse. I believe that that's a lie. They lie a lot, and they deceive a lot, and it is evident through every action that they've ever done with us. The truth is, ladies and gentlemen, these creatures might be from Mars, really. They claim that they are from a planet which revolves around the red star, which we call Betelgeuse. They stated that their planet was dying and that at some unknown future time, they would no longer be able to survive there. This led to a second landing at Edwards Air Force Base. The historical event had been planned in advance and details of the treaty had already been agreed upon. 
Eisenhower arranged to be in Palm Springs on vacation. On the appointed day, the president was spirited away to the base, and the excuse was given to the press that he was visiting the dentist for a toothache. President Eisenhower met with the aliens in a formal treaty between the alien nation and the United States of America was signed. We then received our first alien ambassador from outer space, his name and title, and I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's absolutely true. His name and title was His Omnipotent Highness Krill, pronounced Krill, spelled K-R-L-L-L -L -L or C-R-L-L-L. -L -L. In the American tradition of disdain for royal titles, he was secretly called Original Hostage Krill, or O-H Krill, so that Americans would not have to say your omnipotent highness. <clears throat> you should know that the alien flag is known as the trilateral insignia. It looks like a TP with two circles on either side of the V and one pole running straight down the middle. It is displayed on their craft and worn on their chest on their uniforms. Both of these landings in the second meeting were filmed and the film exists today. Where it exists, I do not know, but I do know that it exists. The treaty stated, the aliens would not interfere in our affairs and we would not interfere in theirs. We were particularly interested that they do not interfere with anything that would affect our future, which has been violated. We would keep their presence on Earth a secret. They would furnish us with advanced technology and would help us in our technological development. They would not make any treaty with any other Earth nation. They could abduct humans on a limited and periodic basis for the purpose of medical examination and monitoring of our development with the stipulation that the humans would not be harmed, would be returned to their point of abduction, that the humans would have no memory of the event, and that the alien nation would furnish MJ-12 with a list of all human contacts and abductees on a regularly scheduled basis. And this is not being done. It was agreed that each nation would receive the ambassador of the other for as long as the treaty remained in force. It was further agreed that the alien nation in the United States would exchange 16 personnel each to the other with the purpose of learning each of the other. The alien guests would remain on Earth and the human guests would travel to the alien point of origin for a specified period of time, then return, at which point a reverse exchange would be made. I have no knowledge whatsoever of what happened to those original 16 humans who left the Earth with the aliens. It was also agreed that bases would be constructed underground for the use of the alien nation and that two bases would be constructed for the joint use of the alien nation and the United States government. The base at Dulce is one, the base at S-4 in the area known as Area 51 or Dreamland is the second. The exchange of technology would take place in the jointly occupied bases. These alien bases would be constructed under Indian reservations in the four corners of Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona, and one would be constructed in Nevada in the area known as S-4, located approximately seven miles south of the western border of Area 51, otherwise known as Dreamland. All alien areas are under complete control of the Naval Department, and all personnel who work in these complexes receive their checks from the Navy. Construction of the bases began immediately, but progress was slow until large amounts of money were made available in 1957, and in the meantime, work continued on the Yellow Book with the information derived from the guests. <clears throat> I would like to say at this time that the movie that most of you may have seen, how many of you saw Close Encounters of the Third Kind? That movie was absolutely true. Those events did take place. Not exactly as you saw them. Not in the place where you saw them take place. But there was a landing. There was an agreement. There was conversation. There was an exchange of personnel made. I would like to say now also that J. Allen Hynek was the technical director on that movie, and he was also the co-author of Grudge 13, which I read between the years 1970 and 1973, along with another man named Lieutenant Colonel Friend. As you learned last night, it's the real nice guys that get you. 
Right, Phil? <laughs> Project Red Light was formed, and experimentation and test flying alien craft was begun in earnest. As I told you earlier, many of the craft we recovered were intact, appeared to have no damage whatsoever. One craft actually exploded over the test site during testing sometime in the early 60s. I'm not sure what the exact date is, uh, but the explosion is said to have been seen over three states. Project Red Light, according to the information that I have, was postponed at that time because they had no idea what had happened or why the craft had exploded, but they lost the pilots, and the project went on hold. A super top secret facility was built at Groom Lake in Nevada in the midst of the weapons test range. It was codenamed Dreamland until this area was built. Testing was done at the Tonopah test range, and that's why some of you have conflicting information. The installation was placed under the Department of the Navy and clearance of all personnel required a Q clearance as well as executive, which means presidential or majestic approval. This is ironic due to the fact that the President of the United States does not have clearance to visit the site. How many of you did not know that? The President of the United States cannot enter Area 51. There are very many other areas which he cannot enter also. The alien base and exchange of technology actually took place in an area known as S-4. Area S-4 was codenamed the Dark Side of the Moon. The Army was tasked to form a super secret organization to furnish security for all alien task projects. This organization became the National Reconnaissance Organization based at Fort Carson, Colorado. The specific teams trained to secure the projects were called Delta. A second project, codenamed Snowbird, was promulgated to explain away any sightings of the red light craft as being Air Force experiments. The Snowbird craft were manufactured using conventional technology and were flown for the press on several occasions. And those of you who are my age or older will remember as children or young adults going to the movie and seeing in the movie tone newsreel the Avro car and other strange looking saucer craft that were developed by the United States and the Canadian Armed Forces as a prod part of Project Snowbird. Project Snowbird was also used to debunk legitimate public sightings of alien craft, also called UFOs. Project Snowbird was very successful and reports from the public declined steadily until recent years. But not just due to Project Snowbird. There was an intense ridicule, denial, and debunking campaign going on since the beginning. People stopped reporting what they saw. A multi-million dollar secret fund was organized and kept by the military office of the White House. This fund was used to build over 75 deep underground facilities. Presidents who asked were told the fund was used to build deep underground shelters for the president in case of war. Only a few were built for the president. Millions of dollars were funneled through this office to MJ-12 and then out to the contractors and was used to build top secret alien bases as well as top secret dumb or deep underground military bases. I think dumb is very appropriate. And the facilities promulgated by Alternative 2 throughout the nation. President Johnson used this fund to build a movie theater and pave the road on his ranch, and I believe he also used it to fix his shower. He had no idea of its true purpose, but he felt that because it was military money, it was his money. The secret White House Underground Construction Fund was set up in 1957 by President Eisenhower. And you can forget Pruman because Eisenhower has done everything that's been done to us, not intentionally, not to hurt us, in the beginning to protect us. The funding was obtained from Congress under the guise of construction and maintenance of secret sites where the president could be taken in case of military attacks, called presidential emergency sites. The sites are literally holes in the ground deep enough to withstand a nuclear blast and are outfitted with state-of-the-art communications equipment. To date, there are more than 75 sites spread around the country that I can account for, 
which were built using money from this fund. The Atomic Energy Commission has built at least an additional 22 underground sites, again, that I can account for. The location and everything to do with these sites were and are considered and treated as top secret. The money was and is in control of the military office of the White House and was and is laundered through a circuitous web that even the most knowledgeable spy or accountant cannot follow. As of 1980, only a few at the beginning and end of this web knew what the money was for. At the beginning were Representative George Mahon of Texas, the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee and of its Defense Subcommittee, and Representative Robert Sykes of Florida, chairman of the House Appropriations Military Construction Subcommittee. Today, it was rumored that House Speaker Jim Wright controlled the money in Congress and that a power struggle was underway to remove him. We all know what happened there, but I could not substantiate by any source the fact that he was in charge of the money. It is a rumor. At the end of the line were the President, MJ-12, the Director of the Military Office, and a commander at the Washington Navy Shipyard. The money was authorized by the Appropriations Committee, who allocated it to the Department of Defense as a top secret item in the Army Construction Program. The Army, however, ladies and gentlemen, could not spend it, and, in fact, did not even know what it was for. Authorization to spend the money was, in reality, given to the Navy. You'll find out why the Navy has control of all this a little bit later. It'll become clear to you. The money was channeled to the Chesapeake Division of the Navy Engineers, who did not know what it was for either. Not even the commanding officer, who was an admiral, knew what the fund was to be used for. Only one man, a Navy commander, who was assigned to the Chesapeake Division, but in reality was responsible only to the military office of the White House, knew of the actual purpose, amount, and ultimate destination of the top secret fund. The total secrecy surrounding the fund that meant that almost every trace of it could be made to disappear by the very few people who controlled it. There has never been, and most probably never will, be an audit of this secret money. Large amounts of this money were transferred from the top secret fund to a location at Palm Beach, Florida that belongs to the Coast Guard called Peanut Island. The island is adjacent to property which was owned by Joseph Kennedy. The money was said to have been used for landscaping and general beautification. The money did not begin to be transferred to Peanut Island until shortly after Kennedy's assassination. Some time ago, a TV news special on the Kennedy assassination told of a Coast Guard officer transferring money in a briefcase to a Kennedy employee across this property line. It was on television. Could this have been a secret payment to the Kennedy family for the loss of their son, John F. Kennedy? I think it was, but I can't prove it. The payments continued through the year 1967 and then stopped. The total amount transferred is unknown and the actual use of the money is unknown. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Nelson Rockefeller changed positions again. He had been in sort of a holding position until the time was ripe, and now the time was ripe. This time he was to take C.D. Jackson's old position, which had been called the Special Assistant for Psychological Strategy. With Nelson's appointment, the name was changed to the Special Assistant for Cold War Strategy. This position would evolve over the years into the same position Henry Kissinger was ultimately to hold under President Nixon. Officially, he was to give advice and assistance in the development of increased understanding and cooperation among all peoples. Sounds very nice and innocent, doesn't it? The official description, of course, was a smokescreen. For secretly, he was the presidential coordinator for the intelligence community. In his new post, Rockefeller reported directly and only to the president. He attended meetings of the cabinet, the Council on Foreign Economic Policy, and the National Security Council, which was the highest policy-making body in the government. Nelson Rockefeller was also given a second important job as the head of the secret unit called the Planning Coordination Group, which was formed under NSC 5412-1 in March of 1955. However, the memo was written in 1954 at the same time that NSC 10 and, or excuse me, NSC 5410 and NSC 5411 were written. 
It was not used until it was needed. Depending upon the subject on the agenda, the basic members were Rockefeller, a representative of the Department of Defense, a representative of the Department of State, and the Director of Central Intelligence. It was soon called the 5412 Committee or the Special Group. NSC 51 established the rule for the first time established the rule that covert operations were subject to approval by 5410 Eisenhower had preceded NSC 5412-1 in 1954 to establish a permanent committee, not ad hoc, to be known as Majority 12, MJ-12, to oversee and conduct all covert activities concerned with the alien question. NSC 5412-1 was created to explain the purpose of these meetings when Congress and the press became curious as to why such important and prominent men were meeting on a regular basis. Majority 12 was made up of Nelson Rockefeller, the Director of Central Intelligence, Alan Welsh Dulles, the Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of Defense, Charles E. Wilson, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Arthur W. Radford, and that's why the Navy got everything, because the first joint chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff who served on MJ-12 was Navy. If it had been an Army general, the Army would have had it. The director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, J. Edgar Hoover, and that should answer a lot of questions for you, and six men from the Executive Committee of the Council on Foreign Relations known as the Wise Men. These men were all members of a secret society of scholars that called themselves the Jason Society. I see you smiling, Phil. Thought I didn't know it, didn't you? <coughs> Fooled you. Are the Jason scholars who recruited their members from the Skull and Bones and the Scroll and Key societies of Harvard and Yale? And that was stated verbatim in Operation Majority. The wise men were key members of the Council on Foreign Relations. There were 12 members, including the first six from government positions, thus majority 12. This group was made up over the years of the top officers and directors of the Council on Foreign Relations and later the Trilateral Commission. Gordon Dean, George Bush, and Zbigniew Brzezinski were among them. The most important, however, and influential of the wise men who served on MJ-12 were John McCloy, Robert Lovett, Averill Harriman, Charles Bolin, George Kennan, and Dean Acheson. Their policies were to last well into the decade of the 70s, and it is significant that President Eisenhower, as well as the first six MJ-12 members from the government, were also members of the Council on Foreign Relations. Thorough researchers will soon discover that not all of the wise men attended Harvard or Yale and not all of them were chosen for Skull and Bones or Scroll and Key membership during their college years. You will be able to quickly clear up this mystery by obtaining the book The Wise Men by Walter Isaacson and Evan Thomas, Simon & Schuster, New York. And under illustration number nine in the center of the book, you will find the caption, Love it with the Yale unit above far right and on the beach. His initiation into Skull and Bones came at an airbase near Dunkirk. I have found that members were chosen on an ongoing basis by invitation based upon merit post-college and was not confined to over only Harvard or Yale attendees. It also had something to do with how, how much money your family had, unless you were a military officer. A chosen few were later initiated into the Jason Society. They are all members of the Council on Foreign Relations and at that time were known as the Eastern Establishment. This should give you a clue to the far-reaching and serious nature of these most secret college societies. The Jason Society is alive and well today, but now includes members of the Trilateral Commission as well. The Trilateralists existed secretly several years before 1973 because I saw the name of the Trilateral Commission in the documents in 1971. The name of the Trilateral Commission was taken from the alien flag known as the Trilateral Insignia. And that should give you some clue as to how much trouble you're in. 
Majority 12 was to survive right up to the present day. Under Eisenhower and Kennedy, it was erroneously called the 5412 Committee, or more correctly, the Special Group. In the Johnson administration, it became the 303 Committee, named after the room that they met in at the White House when they met at the White House. Because the name 5412 had been compromised in the book, The Secret Government, Actually, it was not compromised. It was intentionally leaked to explain the purpose of the meeting of these men so that no one would go looking for NSC 5410 and NSC 5411. And I wish you all luck. I hope that you're able to dig it out. Actually, NSC 5412-1 was leaked to the author to hide the existence of NSC 5410. Under Nixon, Ford, and Carter, it was called the 40 Committee, and under Reagan, it became the PI 40 Committee. But over all those years, only the name changed. The positions remained the same. By 1955, it became obvious that the aliens had deceived Eisenhower and had broken the treaty. Mutilated humans, yes, mutilated humans, were being found along with mutilated animals, and yes, mutilated animals, and those of you who doubt that this is taking place, should leave your job, should leave your home, should do whatever you have to do, and go look for yourself. Because it's important that you know it and that you believe it. These things were being found all across the United States. It was suspected that the aliens were not submitting a complete list of human contacts and abductees to MJ-12, and it was suspected that not all abductees had been returned, and this has been verified. The Soviet Union was suspected of interacting with them, and this proved also to be true. It was learned that the aliens had been and were then manipulating masses of people through secret societies, witchcraft, magic, the occult, and religion. After several Air Force combat air engagements with alien craft, it also became apparent that our weapons were no match against theirs. In November of 1955, NSC 5412-2 was issued, establishing a study committee to explore all factors which are involved in the making and implementing of foreign policy in the nuclear age. This, again, was only a blanket of snow that covered the real subject of study, which was the alien question. For, in fact, 5412-2 had, as I told you earlier, been written in 1954, when NSC 5410 and 5411 was written, and 5411, by secret executive memorandum, in 1954, the study group was commissioned to examine all the facts, evidence, lies, and deception and discover the truth of the alien question. NSC 54-2 was only a cover that had become necessary when the press began inquiring as to the purpose of regular meetings of such important men. When the press asked Gordon Dean somewhere near the end of 1954 why they were meeting and what they were studying, Gordon Dean says, as of yet, we have no direction but we're working on it. It then became necessary to find a direction and find a reason for these meetings, and that's exactly what they did. The first meetings began in 1954 and were called the Quantico meetings because they met at the Quantico Marine Base. See, one thing I knew, ladies and gentlemen, I know who they are. I know what they were called. All I had to do was find out who belonged to those names. And it's impossible to hold meetings of 36 prominent men secret over such a long period of time. The study actually lasted three years, not forever. It was a three-year study, period. A study group was made up of 35 members of the Council on Foreign Relations secret scholars known as the Jason Society or the Jason Scholars. Dr. Edward Teller was invited to participate. Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski was the study director for the first 18 months. Dr. Henry Kissinger was chosen as the group study director for the second 18 months, beginning in November of 1955. Nelson Rockefeller was a frequent visitor during the study. I'm going to read you the study group members now. For those of you who know who these people are, you're going to be amazed. 
Those of you who do not, I advise that you purchase a copy of my text, which will be on sale at the minute that I finish my last word. <coughs> And research everything that I'm telling you, and your own research will tell you that I am telling you the truth, and I don't have to do that. You see, I'm a witness. I'm not a ufologist, and I'm not by profession a researcher. I'm doing this because I want the Constitution put back where it belongs. The study group members were Gordon Dean, chairman, one of the most powerful men in the United States at that time. Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski, study director for the first phase. Dr. Henry Kissinger, study director for the second phase. Dr. Edward Teller represented the scientific community. Major General Richard C. Lindsay, Hanson W. Baldwin, Lloyd V. Berkner, Frank C. Nash, Paul H. Nitze, Charles P. Noyes, Frank Pace, Jr., James A. Perkins, Don K. Price, David Rockefeller, Oscar M. Rubhausen, Lieutenant General James M. Gavin, Carl P. Haskins, James T. Hill, Jr., Joseph E. Johnson, Mervyn J. Kelly, Frank Altshul, Hamilton Fish Armstrong, Major General James McCormick, Jr., Robert R. Bowie, McGeorge Bundy, William A. M. Burden, John C. Campbell, Thomas K. Finletter, George S. Franklin, Jr., I. I. Rabbi, Roswell L. Gilpatrick, N. E. Hallaby, General Walter Bedell Smith, called Beetle, Henry DeWolf Smythe, Shields Warren, Carol L. Wilson, and Arnold Wolfers. Now, these aren't bad guys. They were a study group. And the first MJ-12 was not made up of bad guys. They were made up of concerned Americans. What happened later became bad. The yanking of power away from the president, the formation of a secret government, the sale of drugs to the American people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to cover most of those things before I'm finished. It's about time. The second face meetings were also held at the Marine base at Quantico, Virginia, and the group became known as Quantico II. Nelson Rockefeller built a retreat somewhere in Maryland, which could only be reached by air for MJ-12 for MJ and the study committee, so that they could meet away from public scrutiny. He donated the land, he built the facilities. Say hello for me, Phil. <coughs> <coughs> so that they could meet away from public scrutiny. The secret meeting place is known by the code name, the Country Club. Complete living, eating, recreation, library, and meeting facilities exist at the location. The study group was publicly closed in the later months of 1956, and Henry Kissinger published what was officially termed the results in 1957 as Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy by Henry A. Kissinger, published for the Council on Foreign Relations by Harper and Brothers, New York. In truth, the manuscript had already been 80% written while Kissinger was at Harvard. The study group continued veiled in secrecy. A clue to the seriousness Kissinger attached to the study can be found in statements by his wife and friends. Many of them stated that Henry would leave home early each morning and return late each night without speaking to anyone or responding to anyone. It seemed, in fact, as if he were in another world which held no room for anyone else. Now, when they say that he would not speak to anyone or respond to anyone, they meant it literally. I find these statements very revealing. The revelations of the alien presence and actions during the study must have been a great shock. I know I would have been shocked. 
Henry Kissinger was definitely out of character during the time surrounding these meetings, as he is normally described as being a gentleman, very charming, and most people who meet him like him very much. Henry Kissinger would never again be affected in this manner, no matter the seriousness of any subsequent event. On many occasions, he would work very late into the night after having already put in a full day, coupled with his not speaking. This behavior eventually led to his divorce. A major finding of the alien study was that the public could not be told, as it was believed that this would most certainly lead to economic collapse, collapse of the religious structure, and national panic, which would lead into anarchy. Secrecy thus continued. An offshoot of this finding was that if the public could not be told, then the Congress could not be told. Thus, funding for the projects and research would have to come from outside the government. There are some things beginning to fall into place. Without aliens, you cannot make sense of anything else that's been happening for the 44 years. You put the aliens in the middle of this stuff and you've got all the answers, every one of them. In the meantime, money was to be obtained from the military budget and from CIA confidential non-appropriated funds. Another major finding was the aliens were using humans and animals for a source of glandular secretions, enzymes, hormonal secretions, blood, and in horrible genetic experiments. The aliens explained these actions as necessary to their survival. What I'm gonna tell you now is very sad if it's true because I am unable to weed through the lies and deception and really find the truth. All I know is what they told us. They stated that their genetic structure had deteriorated and that they were no longer able to reproduce. They stated that if they were unable to improve their genetic structure, their race would soon cease to exist. We looked upon their explanations with extreme suspicion. Since our weapons were literally useless against the aliens, MJ-12 decided to continue friendly diplomatic relations with them until such time as we were able to develop a technology which would then enable us to challenge them on a military basis. Overtures would have to be made to the Soviet Union and other nations to join forces for the survival of humanity. In the meantime, plans were developed to research and construct two weapon systems using conventional and nuclear technology, which would hopefully bring us to parity. The results of the research were projects Joshua and Excalibur. Joshua was a weapon captured from the Germans, which at that time was capable of shattering four-inch thick armor plate at a range of two miles using low-frequency aimed sound waves. And it was believed that this weapon would be effective against the alien craft and beam weapons. Excalibur was a weapon carried by missiles not to exceed 30,000 feet above ground level, not to deviate from designated target more than 50 meters, that would penetrate 1,000 meters of tufa hard-packed soil such as that found in New Mexico, would carry a one megaton warhead, and was intended for use in destroying the aliens in their underground bases. Joshua was developed successfully but never used to my knowledge. Excalibur was not pushed until recent years, and now there is an unprecedented effort to develop this weapon. The people who are working on these weapons tell us that they have never been pushed so hard in their history working on any project than they are being pushed to develop Project Excalibur. Now, what I'm going to read you next may upset some of you, but it's absolutely true. The events at Fatima in the early part of the century were scrutinized. On suspicion that it was alien manipulation, an intelligence operation was put into motion to penetrate the secrecy surrounding the event. The United States utilized its Vatican moles that had been recruited and nurtured during World War II and soon obtained the entire Vatican study, which included the prophecy. And I don't care what you've ever read before, you have not read the true prophecy. This prophecy stated that if man did not turn from evil and place himself at the feet of Christ, the planet would self-destruct and the events described in the book of Revelations would indeed come to pass. It stated that a child would be born who would unite the world with a plan for world peace and a false religion beginning in 1992. By 1995, the people would discern that he was evil and was indeed the Antichrist. 
World War III would begin in the Middle East in 1995 with an invasion of Israel by a United Arab Nation using conventional weapons, which would culminate in a nuclear holocaust in the year 1999. Between 1999 and 2003, most of the life on this planet would suffer horribly and die as a result. The return of Christ would occur in the year 2011. Is this true? I don't know. I know that it was decided by the United States government that this was indeed an alien event, and I believe that this is more deception which is being heaped upon us. So don't go out of here thinking that the world is going to end tomorrow because of this. It might because of something else, and I'm going to talk about that, but not because of this. When the aliens were confronted with this finding, they confirmed that it was true. The aliens explained that they had created us through hybridization and had manipulated the human race through religion, Satanism, witchcraft, magic, the occult, secret societies, etc. They further explained that they were capable of time travel and the events would indeed come to pass. Later exploitation of alien technology by the United States and the Soviet Union utilizing time travel confirmed that indeed something bad was going to happen. The aliens showed a hologram which they claimed was the actual crucifixion of Christ, which the government filmed. We did not know whether to believe them or not. Were they using our genuine religions to manipulate us? Or were they indeed the source of our religions with which they had been manipulating us all along? Or was this the beginning scenario of the genuine end times and the return of Christ which had been predicted in the Bible? No one knew the answer, and I don't know the answer either. A symposium was held in 1957, which was attended by some of the great scientific minds then living. It was held in Huntsville, Alabama. They reached the conclusion that by or shortly after the year 2000, the planet would self-destruct due to increased population and man's exploitation of the environment without any help from God or the aliens. By secret executive order of President Eisenhower, the Jason Scholars were ordered to study this scenario and make recommendations from their findings. This was done. The Jason Society confirmed the finding of the scientists and made three recommendations called Alternatives 1, 2, and 3. Alternative 1 was to use nuclear devices to blast holes in the stratosphere from which the heat and pollution could escape into space. I'll buy heat, but I'll never buy pollution. Change the human cultures from that of exploitation into cultures of environmental protection. Of the three, this was decided to be the least likely to succeed due to the inherent nature of man and the additional damage the nuclear explosions would themselves create. Alternative two was to build a vast network of underground cities and tunnels in which a select representation of all cultures and occupations would survive and carry on the human race. The rest of humanity would be left to fend for themselves on the surface of the planet. Alternative three was to exploit the alien and conventional technology in order for a select few to leave the Earth and establish colonies in outer space. I am not able to either confirm or deny the existence of batch consignments of human slaves which would be used for the manual labor in the effort as a part of the plan. <coughs> The moon, codenamed Adam, would be the object of primary interest, followed by the planet Mars, codenamed Eve. As a delaying action, all three alternatives included birth control, sterilization, forced if necessary, and the introduction of deadly microbes to control or slow the growth of the Earth's population. AIDS is only one result of these plans. There are others. It was decided, since the population must be reduced and controlled, that it would be in the best interest of the human race to rid ourselves of the undesirable elements of our society. The joint U.S. and Soviet leadership dismissed Alternative 1, but ordered work to begin on Alternative 2 and 3 virtually at the same time. Those of you in the state of Washington who report hearing machinery underground are probably correct. In 1959, the RAND Corporation hosted a deep underground construction symposium. I have a copy of this symposium report, which I'm not supposed to have. But nevertheless, I have it. It's approximately this thick. 
In the symposium report, machines are pictured and described which could bore a tunnel 45 feet in diameter at the rate of five feet per hour in 1959. Just think what they can do now. It also displays pictures of huge tunnels and underground vaults containing what appear to be complex facilities and possibly even cities. It appears that the previous five years of all-out underground construction had made very significant progress by that time. The ruling powers decided that one means of funding the Alien Connected and other black projects was to corner the illegal drug market. A young, ambitious member of the Council on Foreign Relations was approached. His name is George Bush, who at the time was the president and CEO of Zapata Oil based in Texas. Zapata Oil was experimenting with the new technology of offshore drilling. It was correctly thought that the drugs could be shipped from South America to the offshore platforms by fishing boat where it would then be taken to shore by the normal transportation used for supplies and personnel. By this method, no customs or law enforcement agency would subject the cargo to search. George Bush agreed to help and organize the operation in conjunction with the CIA. The plan worked better than anyone had thought and has since expanded worldwide and there are now many other methods of bringing the illegal drugs into the country. But it must always be remembered that George Bush began the sale of drugs to our children. Now, if you think I'm crazy, get off your butt and start digging because you will find out that it's absolutely true. The CIA now controls all the world's illegal drug markets. The official space program was boosted by President Kennedy in his inaugural address when he mandated that the United States put a man on the moon before the end of the decade. Although innocent in its conception, this mandate enabled those in charge to funnel vast amounts of money into black projects and conceal the real space program from the American people. A similar program in the Soviet Union served the same purpose. In fact, a joint alien United States and Soviet Union base already existed on the moon at the very moment Kennedy spoke the words. On May 22, 1962, a space probe landed on Mars and confirmed the existence of an environment which could support life. Not long afterward, the construction of a colony on the planet Mars began in earnest. Today, there is a colony which exists on the planet Mars. It is a United States Russian alien facility. If you believe it's outrageous, stick around a few years. This is very disturbing information, and I don't expect anyone to believe it. I don't expect one of you to believe what I'm telling you. And I knew that when I came here. I'm not one of you. I'm not a ufologist. I'm not a researcher. I have an obligation to inform the public, and once that's done, I've done my job. From then on, it's up to you, not me. <laughs> this colony exists on Mars, populated by specially select people from different cultures and occupations taken from all over the Earth. A public charade of antagonism between the Soviet Union and the United States has been maintained over all these years in order to fund projects in the name of national defense when in fact we are the closest allies. At some point, President Kennedy discovered portions of the truth concerning the drugs and the aliens. He issued an ultimatum in 1963 to MJ-12. President Kennedy assured them that if they did not clean up the drug problem, he would. He informed MJ-12 that he intended to reveal the presence of aliens to the American people within the following year and ordered a plan developed to implement his decision. President Kennedy was not a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and knew nothing of Alternative 2 or Alternative 3 that I can find out. Internationally, the operations were supervised by an executive committee known as the Policy Committee. 
In the United States, they were supervised by MJ-12 and in the Soviet Union by a sister organization. President Kennedy's decision, of course, struck fear into these people. His assassination was ordered by the policy committee and the order was carried out by agents of MJ-12 in Dallas. President John F. Kennedy was murdered by the Secret Service agent who drove his car in the motorcade and the act is plainly visible in the film. It was stated in the documents that I saw. The assassin's name is William Greer. Watch the driver and not Kennedy when you view the film, when you can find a film that even shows it. All of the witnesses who were close enough to the car to see William Greer shoot Kennedy were themselves all murdered within two years of the event. That's fact. The Warren Commission was a farce and Council on Foreign Relations members made up the majority of its panel. They succeeded in snowing the American people and they hid the truth. And many other patriots who have attempted to reveal the alien secret have also been murdered throughout the intervening years. And that is why I've been so careful about the information that I released, because it was so important that I get here today to be able to tell you the truth, and what happens after me, after today, is of no consequence whatsoever. But what you do is. During the era of the United States' initial space exploration and the moon landings, every launch was accompanied by alien craft. A moon base dubbed Luna was sighted and filmed by the Apollo astronauts. Domes, spires, tall round structures which look like silos, huge T-shaped mining vehicles which left stitch-like tracks in the lunar surface, and extremely large as well as small alien craft appear in the photographs. It is, in fact, a joint United States, Russian, and alien base. The space program is a farce and an unbelievable waste of money. Alternative three is a reality, and it is not at all science fiction. Most of the Apollo astronauts were severely shaken by this experience and their lives and subsequent statements reflect the depths of the revelation and the effect of the muzzle order which followed. They were ordered to remain silent or suffer the extreme penalty, death, which was termed an expediency. One astronaut actually did talk to the British producers of the TV expose Alternative 3 confirming many of the allegations, however I do not know who it was. In the book, Alternative 3, the pseudonym Bob Groden was used in place of the astronaut's identity. It was also stated that he committed suicide in 1978. This cannot be validated by any source, and I believe that several so-called facts in the book are really disinformation. However, I can assure you that Alternative 3 is real. I firmly believe that this disinformation is a result of pressure put upon the authors and is meant to nullify the effect upon the populace of the British TV expose entitled Alternative 3. The headquarters of the international conspiracy is in Geneva, Switzerland. The ruling body is made up of representatives of the governments involved as well as the executive members of the group known as the Bilderbergers. Meetings are held by the policy committee when necessary on a nuclear submarine beneath the polar ice cap. The secrecy is such that this was the only method which could ensure that the meetings could not be bugged and is the only place where they discuss their most secret matters. I can say that the book is at least 70% true from my own knowledge and the knowledge of my sources. I believe that the disinformation was an attempt to compromise the British TV expose with information which could be proven false just as the Eisenhower briefing document was released here in the United States under the contingency plan, Majestic 12, and which can also be proven false. Since our interaction with the aliens began, we have come into possession of technology beyond our wildest dreams. A craft named Aurora exists at Area 51, which makes regular trips into space. It is a one-stage ship called a TAV, or trans-atmospheric vehicle. And it can take off from the ground using a seven-mile runway, go into high orbit, return on its own power, and land on the same runway. We currently have and fly atomic-powered alien craft at Area S-4 in Nevada. Our pilots have made interplanetary voyages in these craft and have been to the moon, Mars, and other planets aboard these craft. There is a group of pilots at the base who wear a patch, which has a little alien peeking over the bottom it has, I think, three or four letters at the top. I forget what they are, but John Lear knows what they are. 
There is a picture of Saturn and a picture of Mars in the photograph. And in the background, there are seven stars which are strangely shaped just like the stars in the Pleiades group. What that means, I don't know. We have been lied to about the true nature of the moon, the planets Mars and Venus, and the real state of technology that we possess today at this very moment. There are areas in the moon where plant life grows and even changes color with the seasons. And this seasonal effect is because the moon does not, as claimed, always present the exact same side to the Earth or the sun. There is an area that wobbles in and out of darkness on a seasonal basis, and it is near this area that the plant life grows. The moon does have a few man-made lakes and ponds upon its surface, and clouds have been observed and filmed in its atmosphere. How many of you remember the period of time, several years, when almost every reported alien craft that was reported landed was on or near water and appeared to be pumping water into the craft? How many of you remember that? Quite a few. The water went to the moon, ladies and gentlemen, to change the moon, and it is working. It possesses a gravitational field and man can walk upon its surface without a spacesuit breathing from an oxygen bottle after undergoing decompression the same as any deep sea diver. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can come from 1,200 feet underwater to the surface through decompression, you can go from the surface to one atmosphere of vacuum. See, vacuum does not cause a problem for the human body. It's the inert gas that's dissolved in your tissues and in your bones and in the fluids in your body that causes you the problem. If this is decompressed properly, you will have no problem. All you need is a very small amount of oxygen, very small pressure to breathe. You will suffer no harm except for one thing, that oxygen becomes toxic after breathing it over a long period of time. Therefore, excursions would have to be of a minimal time length. Other than that, there is no reason why you or anyone else cannot walk on the surface of the moon or in space in a vacuum without a spacesuit. How do I know? I used to be one of the world's experts on deep sea mixed gas breathing mixtures for divers and on deep saturation diving. When I was the head of the Department of the Mixed Gas Deep Saturation Diving Division of the College of Oceaneering. And I can tell you now, it's much easier to decompress to a vacuum and walk on the surface of the moon than it is to bring a man up from 600 feet. I've seen the photographs, and some of them were actually published in a book called We Discovered Alien Bases on the Moon by Fred Steckling. However, all the photographs are not there, but there are some very good ones. I would advise you to buy the book. I would advise you to look at the photographs, get the NASA number, and send for them. I doubt that you can still get them, but at one time you could. In 1969, a confrontation broke out between the human scientists and the aliens at the Dulce Underground Lab. The aliens took many of our scientists hostage. Delta forces were sent in to free them, but were no match against the alien weapons. Sixty-six of our people were killed during this action. As a result, we withdrew from all joint projects for at least two years. A reconciliation eventually took place, and once again we began to interact. As far as I know, today we are interacting with the aliens. Now. I'm gone past my limit. Uh, I'm not going to infringe upon the other speakers. The text of my speech will be on sale outside. I only have one message to give you. I don't care what you think of me. I don't care what you call me. I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. It's important to our planet. It is important for the world. What happens to me is of no consequence, and I knew that when I started this. 
And over the last 17 years, I knew that someday I was going to have to get up and say this, whether I wanted to or not, whether I was afraid or not. Now I am here, and now it is done. And I feel an overwhelming relief. You now have the information. You can laugh at it. You can throw it in the trash can. You can burn my house down if you want to. But I am telling you right now, your future, your children's future, your grandchildren's future, depends upon what you do with this information. Your own government is selling your children drugs. And you don't seem to care. Your own government has given away the power of the people, and you don't seem to care. There is an apathy that is running rampant in this country that is deadly. Whether or not there are aliens, We are truly now, at this moment, a nation of sheep. And ladies and gentlemen, I assure you that sheep are always led to the slaughter. But it does not have to be that way. There is tremendous power in knowledge. There is also tremendous power in secrecy. Take away that secrecy, you make sure that you're informed and you can change things and stop fighting with each other. Thank you. This time, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think a five-minute break is in order. What do you think, John? It's been a long time. And uh, the stealth fighters, 117As, stuff like that. Uh, UFOs wasn't really uh, anything I was interested in, although I'd heard a few stories. And uh, as every pilot does, uh, well, they're always seeing some. I never saw anything uh, until uh, March 22nd of this year, which I'll tell you about. But my interest uh, you know, in UFOs came about uh, three and a half years ago. A friend of mine. Uh, who flew uh, in Laos with me. He was a raven. If any of you followed uh, those guys, they were people that were taken out of the Air Force, given civilian ID, and they flew directly for the U.S. ambassador in Laos uh, up on the uh, PDJ, the plane of jars. They did the forward air control for the U.S. airplanes that would come into the secret war in Laos. Anyway, Greg came in town about uh, three and a half, four years ago, and he was retiring. He came over to the house, and I hadn't seen him since very early 70s. We started talking, asked him where all he'd been uh, all these years, and uh, one of the bases that he said he'd flown at uh, was Bentwaters. Well, Bentwaters Air Force Base is a United States Air Force Base about 70 miles north of London. And supposedly in 19, or in, uh, on December 30th, 1980, a UFO landed there, and supposedly some, some aliens got out, and I'd heard the story. And when he mentioned Bentwaters, they said, oh, Bentwaters, that's supposedly where that UFO landed. And he said, no, John, not supposedly, it did. He said, I didn't see it because I was confined to quarters, but I know the guys who did. And if you see them, just tell them we were, you know, we flew together in Laos, and they'll tell you, what the scoop was. So he gave me the names of General Gordon Williams, uh, Major Ted Conrad, Colonel Chuck Hall, and a few others. 
And I looked at Greg and I said, you mean all this stuff is real? There really are UFOs and aliens and all that? And he said, well, I don't know about the aliens, he said, but the UFOs are real. So I got to thinking, boy, here's something I've been missing. He's, and uh, out of my airline indication and everything, I better, I better find out what's going on. So I set out on a search. Uh, it took about three and a half, four years uh, to find out uh, what was going on. And I uh, dipped down into my um, reserve of intelligence contacts. Uh, I made a lot of trips around the United States, made a lot of phone calls. Got my truck uh, one month, spent a month going out, driving around Arizona, Colorado, and New Mexico, talking to people who would not talk on the phone, but who would uh, talk to me face to face. And these included Army, uh, Navy. Incidentally, Navy's got the, the control of this entire cover up. Everybody is, is thinking it's the Air Force, you know, and they're always right to the Air Force this and the Air Force that. They don't have anything to do with it, it's the Navy. And I talked to uh, various DIA, CIA people, and when I got back in December 1987, I wrote what became known as the John Lear Hypothesis, and which since has been proven to be uh, absolutely, totally right on the mark, true, except for various dates, maybe uh, one or two months off. Uh, but it, it's checked out thoroughly, and I'll tell you how. And one of, the, one of the people I ran into was a guy named Larry Warren, and Larry Warren was a, the, uh, at Bentwaters, he was with security police, and he was uh, foreign part of the perimeter guard that surrounded this UFO when it landed. Okay. Larry was uh, part of this uh, perimeter guard that surrounded the UFO. And Larry was in town uh, the other day. Uh, in 1985, CNN did a 30-minute uh, special on the Bentwaters incident. And uh, what I'd like to show you here is the most comprehensive cover-up in the history of mankind. It's why most people think of flying saucers as a joke. This nation has been systematically and thoroughly brainwashed into believing that flying saucers do not exist. We have been conditioned to think of extraterrestrials in terms of the distance of the way, the time to travel on the the speed of light, the serious news media leans over backwards to avoid news in any way except the season. TV and tabloids operate a censorship in reverse by exaggerating sensationalizing the facts of today's history. They reduce them to absurdity. Ridicule. Ridicule is defined as words or actions intended to evoke contemptuous laughter at a person or a thing. Fear of ridicule is the primary emotion on which the government's cover up of UFO was based. But let me tell you something our survival, yours and mine, depend on our ability to recognize that we have been beaten by a well meaning but inept military and government into believing that there is no threat and that flying saucers do not exist. For those who believe they exist and entertain the simplistic belief that they are all our benevolent space brothers here to guide us into a battle-free utopian society fails to correlate with the known facts of numerous case histories. Here's what one Navy captain involved in the cover-up said to Ray Stanford, eminent UFO researcher, after he caught Stanford with a piece of an extraterrestrial press, which incidentally came from the Socorro incident. He says, you have no right to that dynamite. What do you want to do? Blow up the whole economy, the entire social structure, and every other institution worth keeping? Those in a position to know are under no delusion. They know the facts. People are not ready to know the facts. And they have no need to know the facts. They could, half of them, half the people maybe go off the deep end. So Stanford asked the captain if those in the know had cracked up after learning the facts. I doubt it, he was told, but those men are trained to meet and accept crises. They are capable of rational judgment in the face of the unexpected. Their decisions are based on experience in considering the welfare of larger groups of people. That provides experience and discernment that the average man, not even the UFO researcher, ever has. Well, isn't that special?
Giordano Bruno got burned at the stake in the year 1600 for daring to say that the sun does not revolve around the earth. Even though he was correct, people did not want to hear it. The church did not want to hear it. And the fact that the earth revolves around the sun was successfully suppressed for another 200 years. It eventually caused a major upheaval in the church, government, and thought. A realignment of social and traditional values. Today, I'm telling you that a small group of military and civilian thugs usurping the constitutional authority of the Senate and the Congress entered into an illegal agreement with an alien nation in which, under the cover of national security, human lives were traded for highly advanced technology. The enormous cause involved in this cover-up and production of the technology was financed by the importation of massive amounts of drugs from Southeast Asia. Fortunately for my efforts to get the truth out, all I'm getting is a little ridicule. But let me tell you my story, and you can make up your own mind whether or not it's true. In its effort to protect our democracy, our secret government made a deal with this alien nation. But we were double-crossed, and the government believes that it's vitally important that you don't find anything about it until they can get things under control. But the situation now is so far out of hand at this point that there is very little chance of that. And I believe that you have the right to know the truth. It's your right as an American. It's your right as a human being. What I'm going to tell you now is true beyond a shadow of a doubt. It's not important that you believe it now. Just listen and follow it away. In the next few months, maybe even years, you'll wake up one fine day and say to yourself, my gosh, the son of a gun was right. Of course, by then it'll be too late. So listen up. Number one. The United States government, since July 7, 1947, has collected and has in its possession at least 15, but probably closer to 25, extraterrestrial flying saucers belonging to at least three different alien civilizations from far beyond our solar system. At least five are undamaged, and the Air Force has flown these under a secret program known as Project Red Light, which is continuing to this date at the Nevada test site, and I'll show you exactly where in a few minutes. Number two. The United States government has in cryogenic storage at least 30, but maybe closer to 100 alien bodies representing as many as three different civilizations from far beyond our solar system. The bodies were or are kept at Wright-Patterson and Homestead Air Force bases, and there is an alien corpse display at the CIA facility in Langley, Virginia. At least three of the aliens were captured alive, and one is still living up at Groom Lake, Nevada, and I'll show you exactly where. Number three, at least one million Americans and probably far more have been abducted since the early 1940s. These abductions last about two hours and are carried out for three purposes. The first purpose is to insert a tiny transmitter the size of a BB or in some cases much smaller into the brain of the subject in order to cert monitor certain biological functions, the specifics of which we are unknown to us at this time. The transmitters are implanted into human beings first at the age of four or five. They are picked up again and checked that out at the age of 10 or 12, and at about the age of 18, the implant is sometimes removed. The second purpose of the abduction is to program the individual through post-hypnotic suggestion. On the basis of some of these cases, we believe that some sort of an enormously important event may occur within the next one to four years and the abductees have been post-hypnotically programmed to proceed to a certain place and perform a certain function during that event. In some cases, the abductees have been shown what appears to be similar to a TV channel changer and advised that at the proper time, they'll remember what the unit was for and how to work it. Under our best hypnotic techniques, we are enabled to find out when or what. The third reason for the abductions is interbreeding experiments where he'd been crossbed with uh, the aliens. In his book, Intruders, Bud Hopkins tells us about his two and a half year investigation of Kathy Davis of Indianapolis, who was inseminated by aliens and produced seven crossbreeds. Number four, during the past 13 years, over 14,000 cattle throughout the US, Canada, and South America have been mutilated in a completely grotesque manner. The mutilations have been investigated by many state and federal agencies including the FBI, and was the subject of the Emmy Award-winning production, A Strange Harvest, 
produced by Linda Moulton Howe for the CBS affiliate in Denver. The government issued several press releases blaming the mutilations on predatory animals. However, it was proven that the mutilations were performed using advanced laser surgical equipment, which actually cut between the cells of the tissue, a process presently beyond our technology. The animal's, gen the animal's genitals, rectum, reproductive organ, and eyes were, re were removed, in most cases while it was still alive. One in interesting phenomenon in nearly all the mutilations is that no blood was found in or near the carcasses and that there was no vascular collapse of the remains. The mutilations have occurred as far north as Canada, where mutilations are classified top secret by the government, and as far south as Brazil. Mutilations have occurred this year, over 200 this year have occurred in a large East Coast city. Number five, it is unknown exactly which one of the 70 or more alien civilizations which are visiting us at this time are responsible for the mutilations. However, there is private scientific speculation that these parts and their glandular secretions are used for food and or genetic experiments. Now I'd like to show you an excerpt from uh, Linda Howe's Strange Harvest. Disease, lightning strikes, predator attacks, and other natural causes. But in northeastern Colorado, another favorite spot for the mutilators. Tex Graves, former sheriff of Logan County, insists the 93 mutilated carcasses he investigated were not natural deaths. Now, the very first one we had was southwest of Sterling. Now, when we first looked at it, it was just unbelievable uh, that you could take an animal and do this too without by leaving some kind of track, some kind of evidence behind, such as uh, cigarette butts, matches, handprints, footprints, but there was nothing. Uh, the animal looked almost horrible, and it was something that uh, I didn't really want to believe then. And there was, uh, we probably had, had five or six others before I really did believe something strange was going on. We had one up north where we believe the animal was paralyzed and was alive when it was being mutilated. An eye and an ear, the uh, tongue, the rectal area was taken out, but the animal dug a hole with its head, but none of the other parts of the body moved, not even the legs. What force could hold... 76 north of town on a very hard pasture almost like hard brick. We found tripod marks 12 inches across. Now, the tripod marks were 14 feet apart. We found one set that had gone in the ground roughly eight inches. And it would take a good post hole digger or, or shovel to dig in like this. It indicated something very heavy had set down in this area, yet there was no tracks leading from it nor to it. Almost nightly, when this was going on, uh, we could pick out a very brilliant, huge, brilliant light in the sky. And we had a newsman take pictures of it with a very high-powered lens, but all we got out of this was the movement of it and the light showing very brilliant. Several times, we observed a uh, no smaller lights come out of this aircraft and then come down toward Earth. This huge, brilliant light would hang in the air, and then when it would move, it could move up and down, backwards, forwards, travel very rapidly. And after a while, these smaller lights would join up with the larger one, and then they'd disappear. So is the chief investigator for the district attorney's office in Trinidad, Colorado. It's not difficult to tell a predator kill. I mean, uh, a coyote or a bobcat or a lion of course, will grab and tear. Uh, it wasn't that way uh, with any of the mutilations I covered, and the first two were amazing. The others had been completely removed with a very clean, apparently a surgical cut. Cows were laying. They were underneath some tall oak. We checked the upper branches just in case we had heard of the mutilations in other parts of the country, or the uh, possibility of the bee animals being dropped, removed from where they were killed and dropped in the area where they were being found. If extraterrestrials are the ones mutilating animals, 
What do you think the implications are then for this planet? Throughout the mutilations, all of us involved have been concerned with the possibility of the mutilations going from animals to human beings, understandably. Thank God to this point it hasn't happened. Uh, whatever they're doing with the portions of these animals they are taking, I haven't the slightest idea. There's a reason for it. It's not haphazard. There's a pattern to it. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think it's a, uh, a wait-and-see game. What else can we do if we do have beings from outer space doing this with the capabilities to do things like this? Uh, what can we as a human race do? If they uh, have the knowledge and the technology that it looks like they have, uh, we're powerless. So maybe uh, it's a wait-and-see game. I can't see anything else to do. If a secret probe was being conducted either by our own intelligence agencies or by UFO entities, then they shouldn't be leaving a mass of carcasses all over the states because this only in Drawn in 1971. This is a case of the right hand not knowing what the left hand was doing. Uh, it was edited by Major Donald G. Carpenter and Colonel Edward B. Thurkelson. Chapter 13, titled, Unidentified Flying Objects. According to this, the UFO phenomenon has been around about 50,000 years. Chapter 13 of Introductory Space Science brings the Air Force Academy students through about 50,000 years of UFO history. From the 47,000-year-old granite carvings in the Hunan province to the Tassili Plateau rock sculptures of 6,000 BC, to the story of Ezekiel in 593 BC, to the Irish accounts in 956 AD, up through 1742 and the UFO over London in that year, to 1897 when the first cattle mutilations occurred on the Hamilton Ranch in Leroy, Kansas, to 1947 and the Ken Arnold sightings, to the Lonnie Zamora incident in Socorro, New Mexico, on April 24, 1964, a police officer witnessed two humanoids dressed in silvery coveralls jump in a cylindrical type object and fly away. The chapter covers the Betty and Barney Hill abduction of September 19th and, uh, 1961, which became the first widely known abduction case. The Betty and Barney Hill case was particularly fascinating because under separate and highly controlled conditions, each was hypnotized separately for several months with a post-hypnotic suggestion that they would not remember or discuss between themselves what was discovered. After the conclusion, their stories matched perfectly. One very peculiar incident related uh, by Betty was the fact that at one point the alien stuck a needle into her stomach. She asked him why, and they said, it's a pregnancy test. She told him, well, that was no pregnancy test here on Earth. And that was in 1961. It was to be a prophetic account because amniocentesis was developed in the early 1970s. And this was a method to surgically withdraw the fluid from the uterus of the pregnant female for use in determination of sex uh, or genetic disorders in the fetus. This was eight years after her abduction. On page 461 of the Academy of Physics book, this surprising statement is made. The most commonly described alien is about three and a half feet tall, has a round head, arms reaching to or below his knees, and is wearing a silvery space suit or coveralls. Other aliens appear to be essentially the same as Earthmen, while still others have particularly wide wraparound eyes or mouths with very thin lips. There is a rare group, reporters about four feet tall, weight of around 35 pounds and covered with thick hair or fur. Members of this last group are described as being extremely strong. Now I'd like to show you something similar to this. This comes from the Stringfield documents. Here's a picture of what is known as uh, the gray. We've all seen this. Up at the test site, their nicknames are the gourds. They call them the gourds because of the shape of their heads. At least that's what the guards call them. Uh, they probably come from a star system known to us as Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2, about 37 year, light years away from us. Uh, as you can see, the relative portions are of a, a, a five-month fetus. These drawings were made uh, with the help of a CIA informant and a surgeon who performed an autopsy of a gray in the late 40s. 
Here's the detail of the head. There is a large brow. The eyes are quite large, brown in color with no eyelids. Here's a detail uh, of the hand. It has four fingers which are slightly webbed with no opposable thumb. And the following items were noted by an autopsy, uh, during an autopsy, by an army surgeon at Walter Reed in the late 40s. About three and a half to four feet tall, weight of about 40 pounds. Two almond-shaped eyes without pupils, no earlobes. Mouth small, appears not to function as a means of communication or means of food ingestion. Arms extending to the knees. Skin blue or gray, no teeth, no apparent reproductive organs, colorless liquid prevalent in the body without red cells, no digestive tract. The available evidence indicates that we have a wide variety of visitors, about 70 different species in fact, with various different types of motivation for being here and different ways of interacting with us. Some have had us under surveillance since deep and took antiquity periodically stimulating our developments. Since 19,000 sightings of enormous craft swooping low over the Hudson Valley in New York, in October and November of 1987, there were hundreds of recorded sightings of craft larger than the 747 flying slowly over Whitfield, Virginia, reported variously as huge triangles or disc-shaped objects. In the past year, human and animal mutilations continue unabated in New York, Nevada, and the Midwest. Abductions are continuing nationwide. The foreman Arkansas sightings of huge objects have started again. The Oklahoma sightings of February 1st, 1989 were a dazzling array of unidentified flying objects seen by more than dozens. Then there were the sightings in, in Key Largo, January 12th, and continued sightings in Illinois, Wisconsin, was Kansas, Washington, Alabama, Pennsylvania, and nightly sightings in Central America, particularly Guatemala City. On March 4th, 1980, 88, the ABC affiliate in Pensacola, Florida, presented a 30-minute documentary showing 36 clear photos and a minute and 38 seconds of an extraterrestrial craft, and these sightings are still continuing. Let me show you. They proudly thought of themselves the most powerful nation on Earth, having recently produced the atomic bomb, bomb and one world war. They had built jet aircraft that uh, would exceed the speed of sound in a few months. They had built bombers with intercontinental range that could carry weapons of enormous destruction. The post-war era had brought economic prosperity and the future seemed bright. Now just imagine what it was like for those same leaders, all of whom had witnessed the panic of the Orson Welles broadcast of the War of the Worlds in 1938, just seven or nine years earlier. Thousands of Americans had panicked at a realistically presented invasion of Earth by beings from another planet. Imagine their horror as they actually viewed the dead bodies of the real aliens, frightening little creatures with enormous eyes, reptilian skin, and claws at the end of their fingers. Imagine their shock as they attempted to determine how the strange saucers were powered and could discover no part even remotely similar to components they were familiar with. No cylinders, no pistons, no vacuum tubes, no turbines, no hydraulic actuators. It's only when you fully understand the overwhelming helplessness the government was faced with in the summer of 1947 can you comprehend their perceived for a total their perceived need for a total thorough and sweeping cover up to include the use of deadly force. This enormous cover up was initiate, initiated on September 24, 1947 by President Truman by an executive order which established a group of 12 top military, scientific, and intelligence personnel of their time. They were known as the MJ-12. Although the group exists today, none of the original members are still alive. Uh, Gordon Gray was the last member to pass away, as the original member. As each member passed away, another was appointed to fill the position. The group today is composed of more members than the original 12, and among those who are thought to be current members are Dr. Kissinger, Dr. Ed Teller, General Lou Allen, uh, head of uh, space technology, and Admiral Bobby Inman. On November 18, 1952, President-elect Eisenhower was briefed on Majestic 12 and the cover-up by Admiral Roscoe H. Hillencotter. Hillencotter was MJ-1 and had been the director of Central Intelligence Agency from May of 47 to September of 50. 
Sometime during the latter part of 1953 or the early part of 54, President Eisenhower was rushed from a vacation in Palm Springs to Muroc Dry Lake, which is now called Edwards Air Force Base, and witnessed a flying saucer. According to some sources, Eisenhower told the aliens that the world is not ready for them, and that's where the matter rested for about 10 years. Incidentally, one of our well-known astronauts witnessed that saucer landing at Muroc Dry, Muroc Dry Lake. Project Blue Book made 14 reports before it was terminated by the Air Force in 1969 after reviewing the Condon Report. The public got to see 13 of the reports, number 1 through 12, and number 14. Project Blue Book Report number 13 consisted of 624 pages typed offset, reproduced on white paper with a gray cover. It covered U.S. government official UFO procedures, classifications, and all top secret UFO activity from 1942 through 1951, addendum to 1963. Last year, I met with a former information analyst with the Air Force Electronic Security Services who saw an actual copy of the Project Grudge Blue Book Report number 13. This man's name is Bill English and will be speaking with us today. I also talked with Bill Cooper, formerly of Naval Intelligence Briefing Team, who also saw the Grudge 13 report. I also talked with a government scientist who also saw a copy of the report. Here are some of the things that they remembered as being in the document. Chapter 1, UFO activity, significant UFO sightings, UFO landings, UFO alien close approaches, abductions, detention, crashed UFOs, UFO retrievals, sensitive military and industrial areas where close encounters occurred, technical details on dismantled UFOs, UFO physics, exotic nuclear and weaponry, clean breeder reactor the size of a football, ultrasonic light ray and beam weapons. Chapter two was the photographic section, included all glossy pages, photos either three and a half by five or eight by 10. Photos of sensitive UFOs, color photographs of uh, crashed UFOs, three in con good condition, one dismantled. Color, folks, uh, color photographs of uh, deceased aliens averaged four and a half feet tall. Color photographs of three live aliens. Color photographs of human mutilations, including head, rectum, sex organs, internal organs, blood removal, etc. Chapter three was human and humanoid aliens, humanoid species, humanoid autopsies, no indication of age, small species similar to human varied in a height a few inches, liquid chlorophyll-based nourishment. At this time, they were aware of 17 different species. Food absorbed through the mouth membrane, waste excreted through the skin, language similar in appearance to Sanskrit, used mathematical phrases. Live alien communicated only desired answers to questions, remained silent on undesired questions. In the early 1950s, according to Project Blue, Report, uh, Blue Book Report number 13, people who had close encounters the third and relocated to one of four relocation centers encounter experienced. These sites were located in the Midwest and the Northwest U.S. with one site on the Utah-Nevada border. These relocation centers had extensive medical facilities available to deal with all medical emergencies, including radiation poisoning, psych psychotherapy, and deprogramming. One example of uh, this is the Darlington Farm case of Ohio in 1953. As they sat there eating dinner, the lights in the farmhouse began to dim. Outside, the dogs and other animals began to raise a ruckus. The 13-year-old boy gets up from the dinner table, see what's going on. He calls to his mother and father to come outside and see a funny light. The mother and father went out on the porch. As they got to the porch, one of the dogs broke loose and ran into an open field in front of the house. The boy began chasing it as the light came down and began to hover, over in, uh, hover in the open field. As the mother and father watched, the boy started screaming for help. The father grabbed his shotgun and ran into the field, only to witness his son being dragged away by little humanoids into the, fire, into the fiery, large-looking object. The father fired several rounds into the object, but to no avail, and it took off. They found the dog with its head crushed, but no sign of the, bo of the boy or any other footprints. The father immediately called Darlington police, and they came out to investigate. Their official report read that the boy had run off and was lost in the forest which Bubba bordered the farm. Within 48 hours, the Air Force made the determination that the family was to be relocated and the mother and father were picked up by Air Force intelligence and all personal belongings and possessions were loaded into Air Force trucks 
and moved to a Northwestern relocation site. The mother was in shock and had to go through a great deal of psych psychotherapy and deprogramming, as did the father. On April 25th, 1964, the first official communication, communication between the aliens and our U.S. government took place at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. Three saucers came in, one landed at a prearranged area, and a meeting was held between the aliens and intelligence officers of the U.S. government. The whole sequence was filmed by five motion picture cameras. An acquaintance of mine in uh, Los Angeles, Bob Emenager, was given 800 feet of this film in 1973 to view when he was asked to prepare a documentary when it was decided to originally release the truth about flying saucers to the public. This was in the beginning of 1973. Unfortunately, when Watergate developed, it was decided the public could not handle two traumatic developments at the same time, and the document was changed. The document, which you can still get today, but I don't know where, started and it gave you the whole history of UFOs up into the very end, and the, the very the crowning thing for this documentary, which was narrated by Rod Serling, was they were going to show this uh, landing at Holloman, the actual film. But what happened is that because of uh, Watergate, they decided that uh, they were not going to release the true information to the public, and the end they changed and they put in drawings, and the drawings at the end simulate. And Rod Serling, I'll show you this just this one cut from uh, uh, UFOs that has begun. And Rod says, um, let's consider an incident that may happen in the future or could have already happened in the past. Well, of course, it already did happen in the past, but they weren't going to tell the public. And one of the interesting things about this is if you look very closely, and I'll try and point it out, there is a seven-second segment right after the, after the beginning, and I'll show you where it is, that's part of the real film. And I was over in uh, Frankfurt about oh, almost a year ago with Emenager, and uh, we were in the bar talking about the film, and I said, you know, how did you guys fake that uh, saucer shot, that one coming over the hill where the camera zooms in? I said, it's awful hard to tell. I said, boy, it kind of looks like it might be part of the real film to me. And he said, yeah, it is part of the real film. And uh, he sa I said, well, he said, let me guess. You left it in there because, one, the, the public wouldn't believe it. And number two, would it cost too much money to fake it? He said, yeah. The number, he said, that's exactly right. The public would not believe it. It's too short a segment. You can't really tell. And it saved us a lot of money trying to fake it. So I'll point out that seventh segment. And that is part of the real shot coming in. That will be made. Let's look at an incident that might happen in the future, or perhaps could have happened already. The premise is that contact is made by extraterrestrial beings with representatives of the United States Air Force at Holloman Air Force Base in the deserts of New Mexico. The day is clear. It's about 5.32 a.m. at Holloman Air Force Base. Traffic light. One recon plane is on the field ready for takeoff when Sergeant Mann is given a report of an approaching unidentified craft. Yeah, Bill, uh, no, nothing on the board. I'll repeat it again. Uh, unidentified approaching objects on coordinate 49 and 34 degrees southwest while I'm right there. Can I go north east? Uh, probably a stray civilian, maybe. Uh, keep me on board. I see him over there. Check with Edwards. Make contact with him, Bill. Uh, this is Holloman Air Force Base Control Tower. Identify yourself. Sergeant Wentworth speaking. Yes. Yes, hold on. Colonel, for you. This is Colonel Horner, yes. Yes, an unidentified vehicle. You warned the aircraft again. One four two turn left in zero four zero radar contact. Check Edwards. Civilian patrol. Okay, all right. Uh, down to red alert. Unidentified aircraft approaching. Hey, Bill, give me a quick check with Wright Patterson Intelligence. It may be an experimental craft from somewhere. I don't know here. Alert the fire chief and security and safety.
interceptors are dispatched to escort the unidentified crafts out of the area. During a routine photographic mission, a tech sergeant and staff sergeant of the base photographic team were aboard a helicopter at the time and run off several feet of film of the three objects, one of which breaks away and begins a descent. A second high-speed camera crew on the ground runs off approximately 600 feet. The cameras continue to roll as the extraordinary vehicle comes into view. It hovers almost silently about 10 feet off the ground for nearly a minute and yaws like a ship at anchor, then sets down on three extension pads. Commander and two officers, along with two base Air Force scientists, arrive and wait apprehensively. A panel slides open on the side of the craft, stepping forward, one, then two, and a third, what appear to be men dressed in tight-fitting jumpsuits, perhaps short by our standards, with an odd blue-gray complexion, eyes set far apart, a large pronounced nose. They wear a headpiece that resembles a rope-like design. The commander and the two scientists step forward to greet the visitors. Arrangements are made by some sort of communication, and the group quickly retires to an inner office in the King One area. Left behind stand a stunned group of military personnel. Who the visitors are, where they're from, and what they want is unknown. We now have a new challenge, perhaps the most monumental in recorded history. The opportunity to investigate a phenomenon that could change our destiny. Through the study and understanding of the UFO phenomena, we may discover a new energy force, or how to use it, or it could lead to an understanding of our relationship to life throughout the universe. And if there are beings from distant advanced societies, we may be privileged to see a revelation a look at ourselves a thousand years in the future. And perhaps at this very moment, located in another galaxy, somewhere in infinite space, other beings raise similar questions and discuss the possibilities of life outside their planet and talk about Earth as part of their plans for the near future. Colonel was the head of audio visual at Norton Air Force Base. And he actually saw the film run through. Uh, Robert Emenager saw blow-ups from the original frames uh, of the uh, film. In the late 1960s and possibly earlier, MJ-12, representing the U.S. government, made a deal with these creatures called EBEs. The deal was that in exchange for super-advanced weapon technology that the aliens would provide to us, we agreed to ignore the abductions that were going on, and further, we would help suppress the information on the cattle mutilations. The EBEs assured MJ-12 that these abductions, usually lasting about two hours, were merely the ongoing monitoring of a developing civilization. In fact, the abductions were for a much more sinister reason. The U.S. government was not initially aware of the far-reaching consequences of their deal. They were led to believe that the abductions were essentially benign, and since they figured they would probably go on anyway, they agreed and merely insisted that a list of current abductees be submitted to MJ-12. Does this sound incredible, unbelievable? Those responsible for this disaster hope and pray you will dismiss it as so much rubbish. But it's getting harder and harder for Americans to buy this cover-up. There has not been one, not one official statement from the government on flying saucers since 1969 when the Connor report said that they didn't exist and when the Air Force closed Project Blue Book. Not one government official has uttered a word about flying saucers except President Reagan. What did President Reagan say? Well, in the last two years of his presidency, he made four references to a threat by invaders from outer space. The first one was on December 4th, 1985. You can write, get a copy of this uh, statement. The march of the president to the Falston High School students and faculty, wherein he says, I couldn't but one point in our discussions privately with General Secretary Gorbachev, when you stop to think that they we're all God's children wherever we may live in this world, I couldn't help but say to him, just think how easy his task and mine might be in these meetings that we held if suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species, from another planet outside in the universe. 
we forget all our little local differences that we have between our countries and we would find out once and for all that we are that we are really all human beings here on this earth together then September 21st, 1987, text of remarks by the President to the 42nd General Assembly of the United Nations. He said, in our obsession with the antagonisms of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bond. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? What could be more alien to our universal aspirations of our people than the war, threat of war? And in Chicago, June 1988, President Reagan compared the danger of nuclear weapons with a hypothetical situation in which the world was threatened by a power from outer space. Now wait a minute, you say. Why haven't I heard about any of all this? How come nobody is talking? Well because reporters don't want to dig. They're afraid of ridicule. They're afraid people will laugh at them. They think it's smart or in to ridicule UFO researchers. You ask, if you ask them why aliens couldn't be here right now on Earth, they say, well, because somebody would know. But I'll tell you the real reason. It's because it's a secret. It's the biggest damn secret in the history of mankind. Now I want you to hear of what some very credible people have had to say over the, for, uh, about flying saucers over the years. Here's Vice Admiral Hillen Cotter. It is time for the truth to be brought out. Behind the scenes, some high-ranking Air Force officials are soberly concerned about UFOs. But through official secrecy and ridicule, many citizens are led to believe the unknown uh, flying objects are nonsense. Here's President Carter. If I become president, I'll make every piece of information this country has about UFO sightings available to the public and the scientists. I am convinced that UFOs exist because I have seen one. What did Carter do for us? Here's what Major Gordon Cooper had to say. Several days in a row we sighted groups of metallic saucer-shaped vehicles at great altitudes over the base. This was in Germany in 1951. And we tried to get close to them but they were able to change direction faster than our fighters. I do believe UFOs exist, and that the truly unexplained ones are from some other technologically advanced civilization. Here's what General Avon Twining had to say. The phenomenon reported is something real and not visionary or fictitious. Here's what, um, oh, here's our old friend Dr. Carl Sagan. He was drawn into MJ-12 in about 1963 because of statements like this. In 1962, he told the American Rocket Society Convention, we must be prepared to face the probability that we have been visited by intelligent beings from outer space and the likelihood that as a requisite to those visits, they would have used bases on the averted side of the moon. Old Dr. Wilbur Smith in Canada said flying saucers exist. The matter is the most highly classified subject in the United States, rating even higher than the H-bomb. And one last quote from an old friend of ours, General Douglas MacArthur. In 1955, here's what he told the New York Times. Now remember, this is General Douglas Ma MacArthur talking. The nations of the world will have to unite, for the next war will be an interplanetary war. The nations of Earth must someday make a common front against an attack by people from other planets. MacArthur said that in the, United, in the New York Times. Now seven years later, to the graduating class at West Point, Here's what else MacArthur said. We deal now not with things of this world alone, but with unimaginable distances and as yet unfathomed mysteries of the universe. We are reaching out for a new and boundless frontier. We speak in terms of harnessing the cosmic energy of ultimate conflict between a united human race and the sinister forces of some other planetary galaxy. During the period of 1979 to 1983, it became increasingly obvious to MJ-12 that things were not going as planned. It became that, known that uh, thousands more than the people listed on their list uh, were being abducted. Some of our top scientists had been, who had objected to this uh, going on, and 50 of them were massacred uh, in the summer of 1980. MJ-12, uh, by 1984, MJ-12 must have been a stark terror at the mistake they had made in dealing with the EBEs. 
They had subtly promoted close encounters of the third kind and ET to get the public used to these small, odd-looking creatures that were com compassionate, benevolent, and very much our space brothers. MJ-12 sold the EVEs to the public and were now faced with the fact that quite the opposite was true. In addition, a plan had been formulated in 1968 to make the public aware of the existence of aliens on Earth over the next 15 years to be culminated with several documentaries to be released in the 1983-1985 period of time. These documentaries would explain the history and intentions of the EBEs, and the discovery of the grand deception put the entire plans, hopes, and dreams of MJ-12 into utter confusion and panic. Meeting at the country club, a remote lodge and private golf course, comfortable sleeping quarters and working quarters in its own private airstrip, built exclusively by and for the members of MJ-12, it was a factional fight of what to do now. Part of MJ-12, which had become now military heavy, wanted to confess the whole scheme and, and shambles it had become uh, uh, to the American public, beg their forgiveness, and ask for their support. But the majority of MJ-12 argued that there was no way they could do that. The situation was basically untenable, and there was no use in exciting the public with a horrible truth. The best plan was to continue the development of a weapon that could be used against the EBEs. Unfortunately, towards the end of last year, 1987, whatever that weapon was uh, to contain the EBEs failed. A new program has been suggested, but it's going to take about two years to put in place. In the meantime, it's essential for MJ-12 that nobody finds out what happened uh, or is going on and the use of deadly force is authorized. Now you say to me, John Lear, this is all very interesting and extremely entertaining, but it just can't be true. It can't be true for one simple reason. The government never has, nor will they ever be able to keep a secret. And I will say this to you. If you truly believe that this government cannot keep a secret when it wants, then I have some swampland in Florida I need to talk to you about right after this meeting. But you say, John, surely somebody would have talked. One of the astronauts who saw the strange objects on the moon, or one of them who saw the huge piece of mining equipment on the backside of the moon on Apollo 8. Yep, a few of them tried to talk, but they were silenced, most notably uh, Gordon Cooper. They are silenced by Janep 146, which is an order that prohibits members of the armed forces from discussing UFO incidents or sightings on penalty of 10 years in jail, $10,000 fine, and forfeiture of all pay and or pension. You have to understand that this is the biggest secret in the world. Now you say, okay, John, you've told me a lot of stories and interesting anecdotes, but what is your best evidence that what you say is true? Well, here's a few things. Let's start out with what a staff physicist who works at S4. I'm going to show you these maps a little bit later. Well, maybe I'll show them to you now. This first map is a map of the uh, test site, Nevada test site. goes all around there. That's the MOA, MOA the military operating area. This area right in here is a restricted area, you can't fly over it, nor can you go on the ground. This area right here, little uh, kind of a uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five-sided figure there is uh, the Tonopah test range, and that's where they fly the stealth fighter, uh, the 117A. Uh, if you want to drive up there, you drive uh, up uh, the road toward Reno, follow it up there like that, get to Tonopah. When you get to Tonopah, turn right, follow the road, all to here until you see uh, you'll see a rocket ship, and it says, um, I think Tonopah Test Range or something, and you take that road all the way down to the fence right here, and then you turn right at the fence, and you can go along this fence here and take pictures all day long. We have some beautiful ones of the stealth fighter that we're taking right along there. They also keep our MiGs up there. The United States Air Force has uh, one of or more of every MiG that uh, is... Uh, produced uh, by the Russians, except the uh, MiG-25. That's where they kept. This area down here is used by the Department of Energy to uh, test atomic uh, weapons, underground tests. This area around here, like this, is used for red flag exercises. That's the military area, uh, aerial training that the Air Force uses for the um, 
Uh, the, it's the Air Force version of uh, Top Gun. And this area right in the middle here is called Area 51. It's also called Dreamland. It's also called the Ranch. It's called a number of names. Anyway, this is Area 51. There's a 35,000 foot strip right here. There's a number of hangars there. And this is where uh, a lot, most of our top secret projects go on. Uh, the U-2 was uh, assembled there. Actually, the U-2 was built in Bakersfield, but assembled up here. Uh, the SR-71 was built in Burbank and assembled up there. Uh, Aurora is tested here. Aurora is the follow-on for the SR-71. It's a Mach uh, 6 to 7 airplane, 250,000 feet, three-man crew. It operates from there, has been operational for about the past two years. But the place that we're interested in is right here. Right to the south here, 10 miles south, it's called S-4. And that's where the government keeps the flying saucers. And you get there by bus. Incidentally, this whole area, you get there by airplane in the morning when you go to work. You drive up to Hughes here, and you go through a security check, and you get into a little uh, 737, white with a red stripe. If you're driving out of town, you can see them parked off to the left there. And they take you in by air. That's how they control the security up there. And when you get out of there, there's very few people who work down here, but down in S4 where they keep the saucers is um, uh, they take you the bus down there, and the bus has uh, blacked out windows, so you can't see where you're going. So let me show you what this physicist had to say, and the date was May 15th, so it wasn't too long ago. He said this on the 5 o'clock news uh, on Channel 8. secret of spots on the planet. It's located on the northeast edge of the Nevada test site and is said to be where weapon systems have been tested over the years. According to some UFO researchers, it's also where the government is test flying alien spacecraft. It sounds pretty far out, but some Las Vegas residents report having seen these flying saucers. A local scientist who says he worked at Groom Lake and saw the saucers joins us in tonight's interview. He has asked that his identity be shielded. Sir, how do we know you are who you say you are and that you actually have knowledge about what's going on at Groom Lake? Well, I guess there's no way you could really know. Uh, uh, there's really no way I can prove it without revealing my identity and getting myself into more trouble than I have already. Exactly what's going on up there? Well, there's several, uh, actually nine uh, flying saucers, flying discs uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin. And uh, they're basically being dismantled. Uh, some are, well, in various stages of, of completion, built from other parts, and they're being test flown and uh, uh, basically just analyzed. You say there's nine saucers. How, how are those tests going? Uh, as far as what? As far as whether they're successful and, and, and that sort of thing. Oh, well, some of them are 100% intact and operate perfectly. Uh, the other ones are being taken apart. Uh, I was involved mainly in, in propulsion and the power source. Uh, and, uh, you know, basically, uh, as far as I can remember, there are about half of them do operate. And the other half are, are just been torn down, uh, basically to analyze the components to them. Where, where did we get these saucers? Uh, how did they come into the hands of the government? I haven't the slightest idea, and uh, you have to understand the information is very compartmentalized, and uh, I was only allowed information that pertained particularly to what I was involved in. But I mean, couldn't, couldn't our government have made them as opposed to getting them from some alien beings? Totally impossible. Uh, the propulsion system is an, uh, a gravity propulsion system. The power source is an antimatter reactor. Uh, this technology does not exist at all. In fact, one of the reasons that I'm going forward with this information, it's uh, not only a crime against the American people, it's a crime against the scientific community, which I've been part of for some time, for actively trying to duplicate these systems, yet they are in existence now and basically in the hands of the government. What would happen to you if the government learned that you were giving us this information? Anything could happen. I don't know. It's, uh, I haven't the slightest idea. But you said uh, you were referred to getting into trouble. Have you had some repercussions already? Yeah, I've been threatened with uh, 
uh, being charged with espionage. Uh, I've had my life threatened by them, my wife's life threatened by them, and uh, uh, I, I mean, I don't know where else you can go from there. Will the government ever tell us about the testing, and, and do the Soviets know about this? The Soviets were involved at some specific point. Uh, they were kicked out of the program rather abruptly uh, in the middle. I don't know why that, why that was or what happened. Uh, they're not very happy about it. And uh, as far as them revealing it, I'm sure they have every intention of claiming that all the technology was developed here, and it was absolutely not. If the Soviets were kicked out of, of this testing program, why wouldn't they tell us about this? I have no idea. They weren't allowed all the information. Apparently they had some and we were basically trading with them. Uh, as far as whether they have disks or not, I don't know. Uh, I don't even know if they had knowledge that we actually had any there. But uh, they were involved to some extent, and I, I don't know how much. What about aliens? Any of those up there at Groom Lake? Uh, I really want to steer away from that right now. Uh, is the Star Wars program in any way related to what's going on up there? I know some people believe that maybe we're building Star Wars for something other than, than the Soviets. This directly taps out of the Star Wars budget, um, which is very hard to follow because it requires huge amounts of money. Uh, it also yeah. uh, it, it taps out of a lot of other uh, places, too, that, that would be very hard to track down. But yeah, Star Wars is directly related to it. Uh, the United States Navy is the part of the government that really maintains control over this. Well, we want to thank you for joining us. It's pretty interesting stuff you've got to say. Thank you. I think we all owe Dennis a hand for coming forward. That was pretty interesting information. A couple of weeks ago, we found out uh, one of the nights that the government was going to fly uh, one of the, uh, the saucers, so we were told when and where to stand, and we went out there, and uh, we got some on videotape, it's just a blob, but I just want to show you this quick videotape we made after uh, with the thing went down, and we're standing around. I'm Lear, and today is March 22, 1989. We're standing just about uh, eight miles due east of Groom Lake, Nevada, the super government uh, secret test site. And just a few minutes ago, we saw one of the government uh, uh, extraterrestrial UFOs fly over there. Uh, we all watched it for about uh, <clears throat> seven or eight minutes. Right here, I have my Celestron scope. Uh, it's eight uh, inches. And I had, uh, uh, had it focused in for about 15 seconds and saw for myself that, in fact, it was a disk. We're going to uh, uh, stay here for another couple hours here to see if we can show you folks uh, an actual uh, extraterrestrial flying saucer being uh, flown by the government. So if you just stand by, and uh, we'll be looking over that mountain, which is where they are. They also come over here, which is over at Bald Mountain. There's some lights over there, which you can't see, but there are a number of trucks. We don't know whether they're looking down here or <clears throat> what they're doing up there. But we managed to get in here. Uh, we're standing on public land. It's uh, completely legal where we are. And if you'd like to uh, come here later in the show, we'll tell you exactly how to get here. Incidentally, the third night we went up, uh, Dennis was with us. And uh, the next morning got fired. And, uh, next morning, he's had three th threats to his life since then. And he's not doing too well. But I will report to you that he is still alive. Uh, just quickly, for those of you that want to go see a flying saucer, you uh, take Highway 15 north out of here to Salt Lake City, and there's a cutoff, uh, Highway 93, that goes to, I think the sign says Caliente. Uh, follow the uh, signs up towards Caliente until you get to a place called Ash Springs. At Ash Springs, there's a cutoff, and you take the left one, and the cutoff says either Tonopah or Warm Springs. And you follow that road, up through the mountains here, and you'll go up through a pass and come back down through the mountains. Now, just as you get out of the pass, right, right there, not any further, you'll see a long dirt road. It's about eight miles long. Get on that dirt road. That's the northeast entrance to Groom Lake. Now, you can't obviously go all the way to Groom Lake because it's a classified facility. 
but what you do is get on that road and let me explain a little bit this map up here and they'll be available to you later if you want to look in real closely groom lake is printed right on there by the blm uh, these are restricted areas, these the yellow uh, or these red areas here. And this area marked in black right here was part of what was known in 1986 as the famous Air Force Groom land grab. And what they did was they grabbed some BLM land here because they didn't want people standing on top of that mountain and watching the saucer fly in there or whatever they had flying in there. So when you go down this road, this from the road to the black line is 5.2 miles. Now, yesterday, uh, some people drove out there and got all the way to the gate. The gate's up here, it's 15 miles from the entrance. And as long as you do that in daytime, they probably won't bother you. But uh, it'd be pre pretty risky to try it at night. They might, uh, no telling what they might doing, uh, be doing. Um, they are, there are soldiers out there. They have no name, rank, or serial number. They drive blazers in uh, camouflage uniforms, as I say, with no rank or serial number. Uh, if you're going at night, be sure you stop there because then you're not getting into the area. But if you go any farther than that, you do so at your own risk. Just some other of the uh, evidence. And we'll wrap this up. Uh, Cash Landrum case, Gulf Breeze, Lonnie Samora, Thomas Mantell, the 1975 SAC base overflights, the JAL incident in Alaska, the Bentwaters incident, the Walton incident, the Pascagoula incident, the Kirtland Air Force Base incident, on and on and on. The Kentucky uh, abduction case, the Wake Island incident, the Harmon Field incident, the South Caicos incident, the Hudson Valley sightings, the Whitfield, Virginia sightings. If you gave five minutes on each of these, I'm sure you'd begin to understand what I'm talking about. Uh, if you're interested in uh, more reading, I would have you read uh, Introductory Space Science, Volume 2, Chapter 13, uh, the Stringfield Papers, the Senator Richard Russell sighting in Russia, 1955, the W.B. Smith Memo, the Dr. Robert Sarbacher letter, Grudge Report Number 13. Then I'd have you read the following books, Communion, Missing Time, Intruders, Light Years, Clear Intent, Sky Crash, the Roswell Incident, Crash at Aztec, An Alien Harvest by Linda Howe just came out and will be available, uh, uh, it's available now. Above by uh, Top Secret by Timothy Good. And when you've digested that information, two and a half years of investigation of UFOs, was the Kennedy assassination. How many people here in this room think Oswald ki killed Kennedy? Up with your hand. Several. Okay, now would you like to know who did? Nearly 25 years ago, the people of the United States and the world were shattered by the impact of an assassin's bullets upon the helpless, unsuspecting young president of the United States, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. The horrendous wound inflicted by those bullets has penetrated deeply into the body and soul of America, destroying the very lives of thousands and the heart and trust and political will of literally millions. And the years that have passed since this tragic event removed from the world stage perhaps one of the most promising human agents of peace and progressive political development, we have been fed one officially sanctioned lie after another, beginning with a blue ribbon cover-up commission to a castrated Senate select committee sh seeking to shed light upon an event deliberately enshrouded in deception, concealment, and outright falsehood. 25 years is long enough. It is time the truth was finally told in the earnest hope that it will truly set us free of the murderers who pose as our protectors. What we're observing here is the motorcade in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. As the presidential car passes behind the freeway sign, President Kennedy is struck in the throat by a bullet that was fired from the grassy knoll. As he's grasping his throat, John Connolly is turning around to his right. He, at that point, is struck. You notice the driver, or excuse me, the passenger of the car turning back to see what has happened to the president. As he turns back to the front, the driver of the car turns with his left arm over his right shoulder with a pistol and fires. You see the 45 automatic, 45 caliber nickel-plated automatic weapon in his left hand, he's firing over his right shoulder. You see it in relief, you see his head pointing backwards towards the president. In this enhanced close-up, you see the impact of the bullet upon the president. 
The force of the shot drives him violently backward against the back of the seat. You see Mrs. Kennedy react in horror. The ugly gaping wound, which is evident here, according to many observers at the scene, was actually created on the print. This was not the actual nature of the wound. But you notice that Mrs. Kennedy wasted no time in trying to exit the vehicle because she clearly was able to determine exactly where that shot had originated. And it was her personal bodyguard, Clint Hill, another Secret Service agent, who attempted to keep her in. What the arrow is indicating here is what appears to be the outline of a man, a hat, and his rifle. The arrow is pointing to the rifle barrel of the man in the bushes who possibly was the rifleman on the grassy knoll who fired that shot. Another view taken by another photographer. Again, you see Mrs. Kennedy trying to exit the vehicle from behind, being pushed back in by her bodyguard. Number of witnesses on the scene rushing towards the vehicle. In this section, the man standing on the far right of the wall there is Abraham Zapruder, the photographer who took the original photos. The arrow here is indicating what was very likely uh, the rifleman on the grassy knoll, the man who fired the shot which penetrated Kennedy's throat from the front, not from behind as the Warren Commission would have you believe. Very interesting note also that the motorcycle policemen were told to remain behind the car at all times. Here you see photographer, again, you see Mrs. Kennedy trying to exit the vehicle from behind, being pushed back in by her bodyguard number of witnesses on the scene rushing towards the vehicle. In this section, the man standing on the far right of the wall there is Abraham Zapruder, the photographer who took the original photos. The arrow here is indicating what was very likely uh, the rifleman on the grassy knoll, the man who fired the shot which penetrated Kennedy's throat from the front, not from behind as the Warren Commission would have you believe. Very interesting note also that the motorcycle policemen were told to remain behind the car at all times. Here you see the passenger in the front turning back, looking at the president. Instead of jumping back to assist him, he turns forward. The driver's now rotating. The weapon comes into view and he fires. You'll see this repeatedly in these sequences. Kennedy's been shot in the throat. He's leaning to his left. The driver now begins to rotate. His left arm comes over his right shoulder, and he fires now. Again, you see the driver rotate. You see the weapon come into view. He's rotating again. The weapon is in view. He fires. You can clearly see his head turning and the, his arm and the weapon extending into view over his right shoulder. Many of the witnesses indicated that the car slowed almost to a virtual halt. Government lie, after all. They lied to you about the Pentagon Papers, they lied to you about Watergate, they lied to you about Irangate, but surely they wouldn't lie about flying saucers. Surely they would have told you if they had recovered an extraterrestrial vehicle. Surely they wouldn't be giving you 1,001 reasons why flying saucers aren't real if they were. And the government is aided and abetted by Carl Sagan, James Oberg of NASA, Bob Schaefer, Phil Klaus of Aviation Week and Space Technology, Remember these names well, for they are known as the keepers of the hoax. What hoax? The hoax that flying saucers do not exist, that ETs are not among us, that Roswell did not happen, or Aztec. Is there anything wrong, Miss Powell? Yeah. What flight? 